This is the Creeps Cast. And the other day I was like, okay, we recorded Friday. Friday Something. and Saturday. And nothing happened. Except nothing. except things happening to other teams and other players that, that have a are like, connection. Yeah, that's it. And they were all just super funny events that got like hashtag fire benning hashtag or like benning like uh to foley ran out of time like a bunch of funny shit trending on twitter so like canucks weren't really in the news but they were which made the past uh three days since we last recorded on friday hello everyone to a new episode of the crease cast i am your host cody sievertson with me as always is the man that built the place to steal a line from david quadrelli lachlan Irvin. still uh, locked away in Petaluma, California, where he is grocery shopping for various, various disgustingly sugar-induced cereals. And I did that. I, I did not. I so yeah. I, had, I sent uh, Cody a photo today because again, this is this is this is the state of the U.S. or at least their groceries, their grocery shopping. I will give them this. They have variety. It's just very specific. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I sent him a photo of me at like Target, which I will say I miss Target. I miss Target a lot in Canada. It's a great store. Um, it has so much stuff. Um, and one of the, I was in the cereal aisle, and this was interesting, especially because uh, Cody and I had been talking about uh, had been I'd been giving jo- uh, making fun of Cody for liking tricks, um, but. I saw this one thing. I saw this one uh, aisle that had let's. So there were three cereals next to each other. One was a Pokemon cereal, Pokemon themed cereal. So it was like yellow, red, and black. You know, very edible colors. Yeah. Uh, very edible cereal colors, I should say. <laughs> um, and not at all atomic looking. And uh, but it was like it was like Captain Crunch. It was almost like Pokemon colored Captain Crunch. Uh, with like Lucky Charms marshmallows in it that looked like Pikachu and like lightning bolts and stuff. Then there was Minecraft Creeper Crunch, which I will say was the one I, if out of the three that I saw, would be the one I'd be most likely to get, probably. <laughs> it, as long as it, you know, is authentic and tastes earthy. That's the whole point, right? Like Minecraft yeah. cereal should taste earthy. Um, and it also it had tastes mar- like dirt. Yeah, it tastes like dirt. That's that's the whole point, does it not? Uh, the and the creeper, the creeper marshmallows in that uh, because they're made of TNT should probably be like what, like liquid smoke. Um, no. And and then the third one and the most revolting of all was Peeps. Was the Peeps cereal? First of all, it's not Easter anymore. Why the hell do you have Peeps anything on your shelves? Let alone uh, as a cereal. Let alone as a cereal. I will say, uh, it's it's not the worst Peeps uh, product I've ever seen. That honor goes to the Peeps coffee creamer I once saw at Target. Uh, it, <laughs> I thought you were going to say uh, that actually just goes to straight up Peeps, which no, is eh. disgusting. Peeps are disgusting, 100%, and I don't understand anyone who likes them. But definitely Peeps coffee creamer. Uh, I looked at that. I'm like, this is awful. Like, this is diabetes in a game. Yeah. Like, is... what are you, why on earth is anyone need this? And who on earth would buy this product other than out of just plain curiosity? Like, that would be... The, like, I would uh, potentially buy it literally just to be like, okay, is this as bad as I imagine it is? Yeah. And, and, and being prepared to be proven right. Um, <laughs> and the same way that, you know... We have been proven right about the fact that, hey, the Canucks should not let, have let go of Troy Stetcher, who's now a gold medal winning ca- world championship winner guy. <laughs> that Man, was I, I love, not my best transition, but you know. That was pretty good, actually. Um, oh. uh, I liked it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Our, our little follow-up after is a little rough, but whatever. It's, it's, yeah, it's fine. That's it's, not, Tuesday, it's Tuesday, and it feels like Monday part two. I don't know about you. Bit. I guess... I mean, you're kind I mean, of on vacation, so you don't know, but like, yeah, like the as I, an employee, it's yeah, been, it's been a tough two days for me. I'm on vacay for the next two weeks, oh, uh, nice. so That's I'm awesome. doing catch up basically, or like prep work for the next uh, two weeks, and so it's been a complete nightmare. But what's been saving me over the past two days has been all the lovely, wonderful discussions on Twitter, on Reddit. 
everywhere on the planet uh, regarding Tyler Myers versus Troy Stetcher. And we can thank uh, the Halford and Bruff show on Sportsnet 650 for just throwing down some gasoline, leaving the match, and then walking away. Because their poll well question, done. who would you rather have, Troy, <laughs> Troy Stetcher or Tyler Myers? And I loved the animosity, the rage, all the people being like, it's Stetcher and it's not even close. Or it's Myers and anyone picking anyone else is a fucking idiot. Like, just so aggressively angry. And some of the tweets that are just like, well, if you ignore salary... Like, yeah, you'd take Myers. Or if you ignore his height, yeah, stature. Like, some of the takes were so funny. And it's just Can like. Can I just say, this is why I love Canucks Twitter. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's amazing. It is June. We mm. have barely been out of the season for, like, what, two, three weeks since the Canucks last played a game. Yeah. And people are already going to the. And people are already starting to ask the question, like Tyler Myers or Troy Stetcher. Let's do this. Let's 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 have a massive con- civil giant, war about giant this discussion about it. And it's like- I and this is why I love the fan base sometimes. Just the fact that we like people don't don't ever tell me that Canucks fans aren't like passionate about the uh, about this team like ever because oh my god, there are so many better things we could all be doing. But in a in a certain way, is this not the thing you want to be doing right now instead of something else? Like, oh my god, uh, ty- uh, yeah. I it's it's been it's been an interesting couple days to say the least. Well, also because like on on the note of the whole like Canucks fans, like they're they're real ones and they're like insane, and that's why you love them because they're passionate, right or wrong. Like it doesn't really matter. And this is why I kind of was like. You know, don't give the people um, protesting Jim Benning on like a 28 degree weather Saturday. Don't give them shit for protesting what they feel is a really poorly run team. Like, whatever. Yep. Who cares? It it has no bearing on you, your appreciation or unappreciation of the team. They're obviously passionate enough to do something that's absolutely ridiculous. There's that one guy wearing that- jeans like on a 28 degree day. Like, you know. Yeah, and that doesn't take away from your passion necessarily. Like, if that's no. not your thing, that does not. That's not a. That's not an indictment on your interest in the team. That's just. No. It's just not. You can, but you. Which is why it's more important that you know you when people do that sort of stuff, you don't like you know immediately just dump on them. You they're yeah. they're they're passionate in a different way. There are different paths to fan interest. And there's kind of a question in line with that, uh, I think later in the sh- in later in the in the yes, show seriously. that we can get into. I think we'll leave that one to the end though, because it's a bit For of sure. a it's a bit of a thinker. Um, but like, yeah, that's that's the way this fan base is. Sometimes we decide that you know what, it's a nice warm day. There are very nice things. We could be out on the porch, actually meeting with people again, because we're allowed to do that now, kind of uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but instead, I'm going to talk about whether Tyler Myers, despite his contract and his many, many, many flaws yeah. is somehow better than is better than Troy Stetcher. Uh, and do you want to? Do you want to actually get into the debate of who is who you would rather sure. choose? Because sure. I, I don't think I made. I think I made it pretty clear like earlier in like the season when like the season was going on. Like you know, I didn't really have time for Myers's defensive play. I don't think he is frankly a good defensive defenseman. Uh, but at the contract they're paying him, you would expect him to have some kind of semblance of defensive play that isn't just like flail to the ice and hope things work out. You would hope you get a lot more for $6 million a season for five years. Yeah. I mean, that $6 million said, is that's essentially first pairing money. Yeah. Like yeah. most, like there are, in fact, there are probably a lot of first pairing defensemen who don't make $6 million. No, like they're... Who make less than they, that, probably. They do deploy him, like, minutes-wise, like a top pairing, pairing defenseman. defenseman. But that's but more out of necessity. Value. Are you kidding? And that's more, and that's more out of necessity than out of because they want to. 
Like, if you'd be, like a yeah. good team would not be playing Tyler Myers 22 minutes a night and would have no reason to. No, and like we, we're going to get into this team a bit uh in like in a little bit but the winnipeg jets moved off of tyler myers because they knew they would have to pay him a lot but they knew that he had very specific value to them as a puck moving goal scoring like producer but you had to shelter who his competition was because when he ate a lot of minutes against really elite competition and he wasn't alongside like an elite partner he struggled and we saw that with the canucks for the last two years where you know he's holding his own and doing like his best but like myers edler was a disaster in the first season this season uh myers and whoever it was on the left side was a disaster like yeah he puts up points he's very good at finding a way to score at the nhl level and that's good but for six million dollars you would hope he could hold his own in both ends of the ice Obviously, the Canucks need the goal scoring anyway, so like they're kind of like, well, it's a wash. We need yeah. some kind of offense from the back end, so like whatever, because they're not getting it out of Schmidt, they're not getting it out of Ben, they're not getting it out of Yo Levy, Chaffield, like Hamannick, even like they weren't getting offense from anyone. So the fact that they got however many points out of Myers, as far as they're concerned, they're like, well, six million dollars, kind of worth it, whatever. But Stetcher's value, obviously, as like an actual like very solid defensive defenseman even in spite of his size like his size his work ethic was like unbelievable and that's kind of what you want in your system on the right side in your bottom pair unfortunately the canucks didn't see it that way they said oh we can't afford to pay a very good defensive defenseman to play on on our third pair because we're not there yet because our cap situation sucks so we're just going to pay T- Travis Hamannick to be our only good defensive defenseman. And, uh, and, look, and even look how he's that kind out. of just okay. And even, like, as as an actuality, like, to be fair to Travis Hamannick, I think he actually, like, exceeded some of our expectations, really, yeah. from what he was capable of doing, which is good for him. It's just still not enough. He, he, he just, it's still not enough for what you need. I'm yeah. glad you took the route of being of the sensible route here, because I'm going to go in a little bit of the unhinged route a little bit Ooh, here. Yeah, baby. Do so, it. okay. People are like, okay. So people are like, well, you know, Troy Stetcher can only play like third pairing. He's a specific role sort of thing. Right. And I, yeah. and Tyler, My- and Tyler Myers, uh, whereas Tyler Myers can play, you know, in different parts of your lineup. It's like, uh, okay, Sure. But how, and again, I already asked the question, you know, like how much is that for the Canucks anyway, is based out of necessity rather than out of because they really, because this is the considered the best possible option, right? Right. And the thing, but the thing that bothers me the most about this situation is that people are looking at it in a vacuum. They're looking at specifically person, how is he doing, like basically like ISO cam kind of thing. Like, Mm -hmm. okay. When I'm like, it's the idea of like, say you're, when people are comparing Troy Stetcher and Tyler Myers, they're kind of looking at them each in a vacuum where they're just looking at them and they're not focusing on the rest of what's going on on the ice while they're out there. Right. Sure. Troy Stetcher, when he's out on the ice can make things easier and make, and can do, and does his job well, does the role that he plays well and makes his team and helps his team win games based on what he is capable of doing uh, and what he does in that set role as specific as it is. He's very good at he's very good at that. He does yeah. not you don't have to worry when Troy Stetcher is out on the ice. Tyler Myers, on the other hand, literally is a black hole. Like every single time he is out on the ice, you are concerned and not only that, you're also pretty sure he's gonna make the teammates around him <laughs> worse and make it diff- make their lives harder. Like when was the last time when was the when was the last time on that in Tyler Myers' time as a Canuck, which I know has only been two years, but when was the last time that you looked at a one of Tyler Myers' defensive line mates, defensive pairings, like the guy the guy playing alongside him and was like, wow, him playing with Tyler Myers sure made him better. Like sure improved his abilities <laughs> and made him a better hockey player. I can tell you most likely there isn't one. There isn't I cannot remember a player that actually benefited from playing with Tyler Myers 
In fact, last I remember uh, talking about Tyler Myers and his defensive pairings, I remember him blaming Ole Ulevi because he had a bad because Myers had oh, a bad yeah, read. That was so bad throwing all and throwing a rookie under the bus because yeah. the rookie because this because a rookie player as you know as maybe he regardless of what expectations he, that Ulevi hasn't lived up to, uh, Myers, you're the veteran. It is your job yeah. to be care, to be responsible on the ice if you're mentoring a young guy. And we've had this conversation before where I'm like, where I've talked about, you know, I don't want him playing with Quinn Hughes because it's going to make Quinn Hughes jo like development that much harder. I don't want him playing with Jack Rathbone because it's going to make Rathbone's development that much harder. So what do you do with him? Like, and he's not trustworthy enough to play a third pairing, to play on a third pairing shutdown role because that's not his thing. So what do you do with him? He's the, the only thing... The, the only place I would want him is in the press box. I don't want him in my lineup <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter what kind of money he's making. He's, like, what? maybe it matters in the sense of, okay, I would feel more comfortable putting him as my seventh defenseman if he were, say, only making one or two million dollars. You wouldn't be, but that's kind of the thing. That's why the contract matters in itself is because because he's making so much money, you have to make it work. Because there's no chance you're getting rid of it. So you have to make it work. And that means you have to play him more or less, even if better options become available. The Canucks in this case don't have any better options. So it doesn't, it kind of balances out. But also, again, how much of that is due to the fact that they're paying Tyler Myers $6 million? Like, if they manage their cap better, and I've, I've used, I say this all the time, if they manage the cap better, we don't have to have the conversation of, whether Tyler Myers or Troy Stetcher or Travis Hamannick is better because they could have had all of them. They could have had all three of them and they could have made that and they could have made that decision on the ice rather than in than in hindsight where it's so much harder to make that call. So like I don't I don't know what I what people want here. Like it's 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 very clear to me that Tyler Myers is not an NHL defenseman and yet we're paying him like he's a first pairing one, which is just asinine like he should be a seventh like he can maybe be a seventh pairing in a pinch but he should not be seventh playing regularly pairing. he's the yeah. 14th seventh or sorry player. seventh pairing seventh defenseman in a pinch but he should not be in your roster playing 82 games a year by any stretch of the imagination like unless you really <laughs> want to change who that third pairing is and what partner you give him and and specifically go out and buy a partner like a free agent partner for him, that can be that responsible when playing alongside him because they don't have it right now, and that's not, no. and it shouldn't be on Rathbone or Hughes to basically be carrying this guy, to be carrying a guy, a guy who is making a lot more money than both of them are, uh, and Hughes probably is gonna want more than him, like so, be and will deserve more money than Tyler Myers is getting right now. So, like. I, I don't know why we're having like I don't I I know why we're having the conversation and it all revolves around the fact that again they didn't offer a contract to a very solid smart young defenseman in Troy Stetcher and yeah. partially that was because they couldn't because Tyler Myers is making way too much money for what he's at, for what he does uh he shouldn't like it's it's very clear that Stetcher is the better player in terms of what he brings on a nightly basis and what he and more importantly what he brings for his teammates when he's on the ice, whereas Tyler Myers is the chaos draft, as Wyatt would put it, and that means that every other player has to work a lot harder just to make up for the fact that they have no clue what the hell one of their teammates is going to do when he steps out there with them and makes their lives tougher. Well, it's also like a case of... Uh, I love your rant, by the way. It's very famous. I love it. It's very it's very up my alley. It's weird Thank that I'm, I'm actually like listening to your... your <laughs> your take and i'm like you know you're being a little mean to tyler myers okay i again i i'm I all think I'm tyler all myers seems like harsh. a tyler myers seems like a nice guy and this is nothing oh, yeah, on sure. the, the guy although i didn't like the u levy thing like no, that was pretty that was that was, that was a bit of a that was that, that was a uh, that's a cowardly thing to do when you're a 30 year old defenseman and you're <laughs> yeah. dumping on a, you're like on a kid and you're dumping on the rookie on, the league, on a guy who's played like, like 20 games like yeah. that's not good especially because it doesn't seem like you're helping him get better in any way shape or form by and doing so it's I like i believe i believe on that play too i'm if i remember correctly he tried to carry the puck up ice 
threw the puck away, and then it resulted in a two-on-one the other way, and you was kinda... already like pinched up, and so he had to defend the two-on-one. Myers like raced back, got like you know kind of in the way while sliding, and they still scored. And it's like you're really gonna give your D partner rookie like shit for like you fucking up. Like you fucked up. Just be like, yeah, yeah shit happened. You're the you're the, I don't you're the veteran. The you should be it. You should be owning when you make that yeah. mistake. That's on you. Have to own up to it yourself. You can't be. Yeah. You can't be throwing one of you, like. You can't be throwing a teammate under the bus. Like whether whether or not like people think Oli Ulevi is an NHL defenseman or not, like you can't regardless of who it is, you can't if you're the older guy who's been in the NHL for what, twelve years at this point? Like or ten like like ten, eleven years, you can't be you cannot throw your young rookie defenseman who you're supposed to be nurturing as you're out there and 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 uh insulating as the as the older veteran. You can't be throwing him under the bus for a mistake that you made and caused. Like that's like then that's and that in itself just plays into the more the fact that Stetcher is a better defenseman in the sense of like you're not gonna you don't have if I put Stetcher with Jack Rathbone or an Ole Ulevi, I wasn't really worried that he was going to like make them make their jobs tougher. Like I didn't feel like that was ever a worry with him. Yes, sometimes he makes errors. He's not the He's not a, again, he is a third pairing defenseman on most teams and that's fine. And that's fine if that's what you want him for that role. But I also wasn't going to worry about him if he, I had to throw Rathbone or Hughes or someone else with him because I knew they would be, he'd be able to carry the fort sometimes, you know, or well, maybe at least communicate a little t- better. Well, here, here's the issue, right? Is like Tyler Myers is an offensive defenseman and you'd expect with someone like with his, you know, experience in the league that he would have some kind of semblance of a defensive game. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the only Canucks prospects they have on D are all puck moving offensive defensemen. Rathbone so is Rathbone isn't a stay at home guy. Uh, Quinn Hughes obviously is not a stay at home guy. Like even like some of like the random dudes that they picked up like in free agency, like Josh Tevis is not a stay at home guy, and he was right. like spent time in the ECHL because he couldn't really figure out the decision-making side that would keep him at least as a relevant or a relevant AHL defender. Um, the guys that they've, you know, picked up like in the draft too, like they're mostly puck moving defensemen that are like big bodies. They're not really the stay at home guy. Like the only stay at home defenseman they really have in the system is Jet Wu. And he's probably going to take two to three years before he's actually like relevant to the Canucks decor. And so, and he's capable Myers of being pretty team. good, so that's not nothing. But well, yeah, you'd hope. Yeah, I mean, there's the, no the, there's no guarantee. Like he could completely fan out. Like, well, sure, but let's let's say based time. on like based on the potential expected of Jet Wu, let's say that he meets sure. that potential. He's he's expected to be okay. Like he's expected to be decent. Sure, like, like best case scenario, he is a four on your right side, which is what they need. Um, yes. Worst case scenario is he cannot figure out how to score consistently at the AHL level, and the Canucks have their doubts, and then trade him away for another Matthew Highmore. Like right. that's the kind of logic that this regime would have. But, um, anyways, like I, I just want to quickly sum up the whole Myers Stetcher thing because I don't want to go spend forty minutes talking about uh, a player that just frustrates the hell out of both of us. Um, the the whole issue with Myers getting as many minutes as he has just speaks to the the inability of the organization to build credible depth on their right side. The right side has always seemingly been an issue after Chris Tanev. Like they really never had, like after they lost, you know, oh God, they lost who was like, Ham Hughes and BXL all. I think in the same season or maybe it was one season for the one guy. BXL was the one after that, and like they kind of lost that yeah. veteran. You know, they traded, I think four. they lost Hamus in UFA, and then they traded yeah. the EXA. Yeah, yeah. So they lost like the veteran presence, like where they could like bring in like other puck movers on the right side, and then kind of like figure things out. Instead, they lost all their veterans, and the, every single guy they brought in afterwards to try and fill the void of like the bottom two pairings have been pretty bad, except for Troy Stetcher, who was actually very good and useful to them, and they said yeah. goodbye. So now. Yep. As you know, well, guys, like Harman, guys like Harmon Dial, guys like Thomas Drance, like everyone's pointed out, the Canucks need to 
radically change their decor in a year when they do not have the money to do so. And because they don't have the money to do so, you're going to see a situation where a player like Tyler Myers is probably going to be played with Jack Rathbone again next season, even though they didn't really gel whatsoever down the stretch. They're not not a good fit. fit. So they need some kind of idea or like play where they get a stay at home left shot defenseman for the left side to stick Myers on the third pair. And if Myers like, you know, ignoring the the contract, if he's producing 30 points as a third pairing defenseman, because you've improved your, uh, your second and first pair right side, you're, you're looking pretty good. You're looking all right. Like if, if Jack Rathbone is alongside, I don't know, like who, who's, who's a name that's probably going to be, gone like josh manson or something like that i've seen his name tossed around a bit that Um, was a question that actually came in and i have uh i have quite i have uh i have evidence for that uh to to talk about that uh this was from if you if you if we want to do that right now if you want to do the question on let's uh, do it because i want to i want to stop talking about tyler myers and i want to pitch other suggestions (laughs) okay so uh at put put goatson great 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 uh yeah uh, asked on Twitter, uh, opinions on Josh Manson. Think he could be a good pairing option with Hughes. Uh, th- and uh, yeah, I actually did some research. I, I uh, this year in particular because of the fact that the Ducks and the Canucks are not playing in the same division. I've not seen a lot of jo- what Josh Manson could do this year. It looked like you know he only played about twenty games. Uh, looks to be you know injury related. He got it mm-hmm. uh, looks like he got hurt about uh, early in uh, looks like I think like February. Didn't end up playing again until like uh, March. Um, and just like looking at their overall, I went to Evolving Wild, uh, Evolving Wild for like some advanced like their player cards to kind of look mm-hmm. at some of like the stuff that they had uh, existing. And just to give you kind of a look for those of you who can't see. And again, I'll try and, you know, I'll try and put this in language that I would understand as well. Um, supposedly, like, he's, oh, like, he's okay. Like, he might do a, be okay as a third-pairing defenseman, but he's, you know, he's 29. He's, so he's not, he's not a young guy. He's already on, under contract right now. Uh, I believe for about, uh, right now he's making a cap hit of about $4.1 million. So that's a lot. That's a lot for a guy who, based on, like, the statistics that are available from, like, his last three seasons, I tried to cast as wide a net as we could, he, he's mostly, right now it seems like he's kind of just, like, a third-pairing guy, and I wanted to see, like, what mm-hmm. comparable, like, if I could compare him to, like, some of the defensemen we have now, uh, just based on, like, the statistics that Evolving Wild had available, like, his offense, he's, like, in the 23rd percentile, uh, that's, like, low, so, like, low, and then defense 44, not bad in the last three years. But Travis Hamanick, on the other hand, is in is overall ranked as like a twenty in the twenty sixth percentile uh, on his own, whereas Manson is only at seventeen. So in terms of like uh, compared to the rest of the league, so Hamanick is kind of already a better version of Josh Manson to a certain extent. Right. Like a little not doesn't have as good of numbers defensively as Manson does. I would say. You know, if he was coming on, say, let's say this was, we're talking about a guy who's a UFA, uh, who is like a, you know, who you could, and you could maybe toss a cheap, like one or $2 million contract at for a couple years. Sure. I could see Josh Manson kind of coming in as like taking a flyer on him for something cheap to maybe try stemming the tide with Hughes for a bit. Um, but if, if we're talking about, like a current, uh, an immediate fix right now where he has got, I believe, another year, another two years left on his current deal. Um, right. It's not worth, it's not worth it. Like the amount of money he would take up, the amount of cap space he's worth, even if you say cut it right down. I mean, I guess if maybe the Ducks were willing to retain literally half his salary and bring it down from 4.1 down to like, uh, I guess that would be uh, 2.05 million dollars a year that's maybe stomachable but again it all comes back to the fact that you know they're investing so much in guys like tyler myers right now and louis erickson that you kind of can't really do that well like there's not a you, good... you can't be afford you can't afford at this point to be paying teams to retain salary so you can obtain guys right like manson to the canucks would be like uh oh no we can't retain uh hamonic because he's 
got an offer for three million yeah. at you know three years from somewhere else. So they think, oh, well, <laughs> let's pay someone to cut Manson's salary in half, or like ask Anaheim to take his salary in half, and uh, then that'll be our Hamnick replacement. But he won't be as good, and. If he keeps on regressing because his point totals have gone down, he's got injury issues possibly, you do not want a situation where you have a $6 million third pair defenseman in Myers playing way too much and then a $2 million defenseman getting paid like a third or uh, playing like a third pair defenseman or worse as your seventh D because he cannot do anything. Like his, right. his, uh, his profile to me looks like just like I'm on the ice and nothing happens and I can kill penalties. Which yeah. to some GMs, you know, that's there's some value in that, but at two million dollars, like surely you could probably find like a better bargain yeah. elsewhere. And and for the other comparables that I looked at, like specifically because we were having the whole Myers Stetcher conversation, I actually went and pulled them up to try and compare to Manson's as well, just to kind of see what we'd be looking at. First of all, Stetcher's is a thousand times better in both is clearly better in both categories. Uh, in terms of offense and defense, to all to to Manson, so he would have been a better option and comes cheaper and is younger. Uh, and then you look at Tyler Myers, uh, <laughs> who is well, literally like in the who is considered like in the seventh percentile. Uh, in, well, I guess technically the ninety third percentile of players, like not good. Like it's not. He is very clearly bad at def his defensive number. He's a three, which is uh, very bad. Uh, his offensive numbers are okay, like 72. Yeah. As That's you said, bad, he's, but literally, he's very he's, good at producing goals yeah. and like generating expected goals for. If but you were paying him, to, yeah, if you literally, the problem is, yeah, again, literally, so Manson would be an improvement on Myers in certain point, in certain aspects, yeah. as would Hamannick. The problem is the reason B Myers' contract is such an anchor, such a boat anchor that you will never that you will never get that you'll never get rid of that they can't even ask really the question of whether Josh Manson is somebody they could potentially bring in. Like there's just no, it, they're they're much better off uh, from a realistic standpoint. They're much better off just giving another extending Hamonic, in my opinion. I think he did fine with Hughes. Yeah. I think. The only time you're going to find a real serious upgrade for, to play alongside him right now is going to be in your own development system uh, uh, or somebody that you picked up, like a prospect that you pick up. So mm -hmm. not you're not going to get anyone out of free agency and certainly not out of trade right now. So because you're yeah. you're operating from such a behind the eight ball, so they're much better off just uh, I would say just giving another another year, going with another year of Hamannick and then seeing at the end of next year, what you want to do on the note of Hamannick. Uh, did you find it bizarre that they only asked three players to design custom hats for the Canucks? I would have loved to see them ask like all the random players, like, like, Hey, Hamannick, you want to stick around? We got to, why don't you design a hat for us? PD and Hughes and uh, who else? Demko. Oh, uh, Demko. Yeah, yeah. Demko. They designed hats. We want you to stay. They like you. Design a hat, throw a hammer on it, or something. I was Why actually, not? I was actually thinking today, like I was like, okay, because or like the, today, because uh, so if we're gonna talk about the players design oh, yeah, series, which it. I do think yeah. is fun. Like I do think it's a very fun topic. Um, uh, I was thinking about like the idea of like it's kind of interesting that they do only do a. That you're right, it is weird that they only do three players. I'm kind of surprised that instead they do, wouldn't opt for like a situation where it's like. Every month we'll have a different player do something. And vote on vote on whoever's you like. Like they didn't. Yeah, like or, didn't it, get a hat. It well. So it, I don't know. Have you followed the design series before? Have you followed not it? Not at all. Okay. I do not. So care. they have done. <laughs> so, so they do this. Actually, they've done this now. I believe four times. This is the fourth year they've done this in the last. I guess five out of the last okay. five. Because last year they didn't. Last season they didn't do it. Um. Right. Um, they've done it, but one year it was kind of more of the, uh, I don't want to, uh, I guess scrubs, I guess. Uh, I remember it was, uh, I think the first year they did it was Ben Hutton, uh, Brandon Sutter, 
and who I sent Sutter's, I believe, was like camo, was like did like camo stuff. And I think Horace, I think Horvat well, actually, you know what? Horvat might have been one of them. It might have been Horvat. Feel, yeah, who designed I actually one of, who designed vaguely one of the initial. A hat. Yeah. I think because I think he's done it twice. Because so right. actually, one of the hats that I am currently wearing, which you can only see if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe and hit like. Um, is I'm actually wearing the Brock Besser one right now. I'm wearing the Brock Besser's design hat right, from with the, with the flow design that, that they the flow designed by uh, they Gran, by uh, Granier. Yeah, I think she got compensated it. after, which was well. Yeah, I think Besser like... didn't. I think it was one of those Besser didn't know that they didn't own it, and he wanted it, so it was like okay, uh, we're gonna have to figure this out after. Um, which is, and it was cool to see Granier get uh, compensated. I I believe I'm I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, because Grain. I don't think that's actually how it's pronounced. I think oh. that's just the joke. Uh, isn't her at whole grain? Yes, it is. It is. But I think that's a bit. I think that's just the, the joke, right? I, uh, I don't believe her <laughs> name is actually pronounced grain. Um, the entire time I've been calling her Crandall. Oh, yeah, literally. Would tell me. <laughs> literally. Um, so I actually, own, and I actually own a couple of them. I Or I actually, I own three. I own three player design series because they're actually the only kind of Canuck merch that I do enjoy because they have a bit oh. of a player touch to them. I have a Horvat designed hat, which is like the black one with like the me the medallion uh, flying skate on it, like the uh, yep. the gold, the shiny gold flying skate logo on it. And then mm -hmm. I have a Markstrom designed hat, uh, from which has like the Swedish the Swedish flag on the brim, and it's got uh, but it's like it's like a green hat with a blue brim and uh, the Orca logo on the front. It's like one of the few green Canucks hats I've ever I had ever seen. I'm like, and it's goalie design. Hell yeah, I'm getting this. <laughs> um, so they've done this before. Um, and every year they always pick three players, but I do think it's interesting that like every month, what like could be more interesting to people is if it was like, okay, here every month we're going to have a new player design some, design a collection. You can either just buy the individual items or you could like sign up for a subscription box where you get all of them every, every month on your door sort of thing. Like that would be a better sure. idea than what they do now where it's like, okay, here are three players all at once. Go nuts kind of thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I will say I I, I am I was interested to see how these uh, turned out. Um, I guess we'll I guess let's let's we haven't seen the full collections or anything, but like no. just based on what we have seen um, here, and I'll pull them up onto the uh, the video onto our video uh, format yeah, here. The Demco uh, one is obviously like Dem number one because it's actually like like most of the time like the players just like reuse like graphics or ideas fed from existing hats like it's the number it's the skates the flying skates whatever plus my number okay it's very simple demcos mm -hmm. is actually like i want a weird zombie johnny canuck holding a skate with goalie gear like yeah that's weird and it's weird they obviously had to create it from scratch which makes it actually like much cooler than uh patterson's very very lame jersey <laughs> <laughs> so okay here like, let's 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 do one at a on yeah let's it. do let's do it one at a time so i think uh so yeah the first one yeah the the demco demcos it, it's they're mostly it seems like it's a black collection it's a black collection i believe there's like a navy blue on the on the bottom of the brim where it's like has got a signature on under on the brim um and then yeah it's got like the johnny canuck logo like the skeleton which he has on his masks yeah. like uh if you've yeah. seen it's a regular feature on his masks um, I would have liked to have seen a little more color. Like, I think I would have preferred it if the cap itself was blue or, or like, a, like that dark navy blue yeah, that fun. matches his colors. Uh, it's a little, the coloring itself is a little plain for me, but yes, the logo is so cool that I am instantly hooked. Of course, I'm going to get a goalie. Does, I'm going to get a goalie. Oh, yeah. Mass you skeleton don't, guy. You don't even like, say it. like we know you've you've already put in your pre order. We get. Oh, it. I'm. Sh oh, yeah. As soon as I can, boo. Yeah, I'm getting that in like a shirt. Uh, yeah. for yeah. So I'd give this one a. I'd give this one an a. It, it, I'm giving this one a four and a half out of five. I'm giving it the the half point is missing just from it lacks a little extra color. Um, yeah. what about for for you? Are you going? You gonna go full five here? Or are you gonna it's, go? It's four? a five because it's not oh, wow. as crappy as the other two. So let's get into the next one. Oh, you're you're is, uh, you're you're grading on a curve here. Okay, okay. Well, uh, like, yeah, yeah. You're grading on you're, you you're, you're you're grading based on the rest of the work. I'm, I'm uh, yeah. I'm fair grading enough. it based on the fact that I've seen Pedersen's hat that he designed, and I'm like, that's complete dog shit. <laughs> See, it is just it is it's like just, so it's just it's hat. also a black hat, but. The the design on the front, it's literally the flying skate jersey. And when I say that, I don't mean, oh, 
you're you're probably thinking, oh, he put the flying skate logo. No, no, no. no I no. mean, it's literally a small like, it's like a, a small patch that looks like the jersey itself. Yeah, it so it has so the arm. It has arms. It's you know what it is. Okay, so I'll say this. I imagine I'll say again. Pedersen is hip. He's a relatively hip guy. I would say as far as like the rest of as the rest of hockey is concerned. I'm beginning to doubt that now. Uh, but see, here's the thing. I could very easily see like a design like this being something that you'd see at like I don't like um, a high end like fashion store, like something like this, and costing like four hundred dollars. Like this is very much a type of <laughs> yeah, a design yeah. that would be at like I'm trying to think of like what would, like um, I guess like a, like uh, like. Uh, Gucci or something. I don't know what hat. I don't know what what fat high end fashion brands make a lot of hats. Maybe like Versace or something. Or like you know, it's very much one of those. Okay, like yeah. If I saw this in like a fancy store on like Robson Street for like going for like four hundred dollars, I would not be surprised. Okay. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's one of those. If somebody high end tells me this is expensive and good, I would. I would. <laughs> We, people would probably listen, but because this is a Canucks hat, a uh, Canucks store hat, people are not going to be t- to take it seriously on that reg- no. on that front. Uh, you can't, you don't get that benefit of the doubt. So yeah, I'm gonna have to give this like a two or like a one and a half. Uh, it's it, it's interesting. It's like it's it's it's. I'll give it this. It's unique. I'll give two I, points for it being unique. I think it's ugly, but it's still a three because it's very like obviously like it's definitely like a high fashion thing like it is so stupid this will resell for six thousand dollars on the open market you'll see like it's it's got that kind of vibe to it like yeah, it, totally it has no business selling for if a lot you, of money but if it you will. saw that hat in beverly hills would you be surprised i wouldn't I know. if i yeah. saw that on Be- in beverly hills like somebody yeah. in beverly hills wearing that i'd be like yeah that makes yeah. sense that 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 totally scans yeah. with what i and then the last one we've got here uh is quinn hughes well this is one of the clips or one of the snippets but this one's of the bucket hat which i actually think is kind of sick um yeah more bucket hats because they're so stupid that they're all they're awesome I, are they uh, so are is this a thing like are bucket hats popular again bucket now? hats are like trendy. are they in like if you look at like pd's like instagram he, he's rocking the bucket hat I bucket know Besser made of one of these as a bucket hat, made this yeah. as a bucket hat, and it was really popular. Um, Unfortunately, but like, is that in, like, is that just the players, or is that based on actual like is that is that an I, actual trend on with with like millennials these days? Like it might, which be. I should know. I'm a I've never seen anyone know. wear one in public, but like yeah, I'm the last time I think a, I wore it's a, a rich white hockey player thing. That's yeah. my guess. Literally, but, the last time I remember wearing a bucket hat was when I lost one at Disney World when I was like eight. Um, that yeah, there like you go. I lost mine at Disney World. That's all I remember about the last time okay. about I, I wore a bucket hat. And I'm pretty sure it was like a Gap or like Old Navy one. Um, I do think the bucket hat itself is kind of cool, but the design itself is boring. It's just uh, it's just the Vancouver Millionaires maroon logo uh, yeah. with a 43 behind it, uh, and it's off it's, center, which. It's a little off the, center the yeah shit out of me like yeah i i gave the, i give this one a zero out of five purely because i when i look at it I, my head does the tilt where it's just like eh, just a bit more to the right yeah, oh, yeah. the, the, the like ocd it's... part of your brain is just like freaking out looking at but, this yeah but i can see why from like a design st- standpoint why the v is covering Astro. four because if you have the r part the right hand side of the v centered over the three then none of the four is covered and it looks awkward because yeah. 43 in that uh font the four at least doesn't gel yeah it if it were literally a different four. Like, let's say his number was 33, like, it would look better. Like, it would look better if it was... It just happens that his, because his number is 43, it does not yeah. look good with this uh, thing. I'm going to give it a one. I'm going to give it a one, uh, <laughs> specifically for the bucket hat, but... Uh, the And my reasoning behind it is, like, I mean, anyone could have made it. Literally, the only difference between this and a... Uh, regular millionaire's hat that you could get at that at the Canuck store is that it's got a 43 on it. There's nothing really Quinn Hughesy about it, other than that. Uh, the bucket hat is the the bucket hat aspect version of it is the only kind of unique 
well, what I would say is a unique aspect because, of course, the Canuck store wouldn't make that on their own. Um, but yeah, I do, I, I do, I do enjoy seeing the players get a chance to do this. Like, even if some of them are very clearly, you know, not as good as it <laughs> at it as others. Yeah. Um, and again, it just gives me more ideas for when we when we do the crease cast store and when we make that happen, we're gonna do our we're gonna do our podcaster our 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 podcaster design series, which are, is going to be you know it's gonna each of us are gonna design some stuff and we'll see who's best. That would be oh, that sure. would be fun yeah. actually. That that would be really fun. We should we should do that. Um, yeah. And I guess after you know talking about something that's not has nothing to do with hockey we should probably jump into the actual nhl playoff stuff because that's important as well uh, yeah let's get into it quick because uh i think the first period is over for uh vegas colorado i've or, like, really are you way ahead of me no no, no okay. There, there's okay. like there's like 10 minutes left so let's uh let's let's uh jinx this right out of the right out of the bat uh i have a feeling the golden knights are gonna go on a run here and face the Habs in the Western final or the, I can't even call it the Western final, just a final because they're, yeah, there, yeah, the there is no, uh, yeah, there is no, there is no Western Eastern final this year. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, that is, I think they've that, broken the curse a bit with the last two victories in a row. Those were huge considering yeah, how the series started, especially game four where they really just, where they, they really took it to them. They were so clearly the better team. Um, the, I will say, actually, you you when you bring up the conference thing, you actually bring up a, a sore spot with me personally, where I was kind of like, I will say, like this year, what was the year where we could have gotten a lot more interesting crossover series, and I'm really sad that that's pro that especially when it comes to the Cup final, we're not going to yeah. get an unusual one. Like it's going to be a Western team versus an Eastern team. Yeah, that's um, disappointing. Which is which is which now? Hey, Montreal could surprise us again, but uh, that seems like a long shot, um, in my opinion. And yeah. we'll get to the Canadians in a second. Um, but yeah, like so far, what I think we've only had three series go uh, that or only two series uh, that have been unusual for a normal season, which were Carolina Nashville, which was good. And then Montreal Winnipeg, which really wasn't. Uh, and then what, <laughs> whoever Montreal, it. and then whichever of Montreal versus Colorado or Vegas they get, which will probably also not be that good uh, of a series. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sad we didn't get more crossover weird crossovers, or like we didn't get the opportunity for say like a Toronto Boston Cup final or something, something like something that we wouldn't nor like a like something of the equivalent of say like getting Vancouver Chicago in like the 2010s like had that been a cup final like that's the kind of hope i was that's the kind of thing i was hoping for mm -hmm. um but from the knights avs perspective i mean like it's it's this is this is i'm glad we're getting this series as good as it has been like i was worried this series especially like out of the gate when the avs just shit kicked the golden knights in that first game i was like oh god like We've been asking for Knights Avalanche for like two, three years now, and it's yeah. going to be a huge dud. And but no, it's lived up. It's totally lived up. The goaltending yeah, has been good, good tight. like, yeah. like don't let the score like the score lines fool you. The goaltending has been very good. Uh, Grubauer has been Grubauer had a bit of a of a tougher game in Game Four, but even then, I don't think he was like terrible. Mm -hmm. um, his defense really gave him a hard time. Like Patrick Nemeth uh, made that terrible giveaway. Uh, to open the scoring in that in that game four, like what are you doing? Um, the flurry, yeah, the flurry Grubauer uh, game has been incredible. McKinnon's been a little bit tough; has not had as easy a series as it looked like he was going to have, which is good. Like it's good that he's not like just clearly taking over at every single aspect of the game because that's a little less fun that way. Right. Um, they're very evenly mm -hmm. matched. We're realizing right now that they're much more evenly matched than we expected. Part of that is due to some bad decision, like, I think some bad lineup decisions. Like, I don't know why Nemeth was in there versus, say, Bowen Byram and why Alex Newhook wasn't playing. Um, like, there were better younger, young options available for J for Jared Bednard, and I think he went for a different, for an older lineup that I think did him, didn't didn't do him any favors. Um, na the Nazem Kadri thing has definitely played into it. Like if the, if Kadri is in the lineup, how much better are the Avalanche right now? Do you think like maybe not a lot, yeah. but I think at least enough to say maybe win one of those games in Vegas and now be up like three to one rather right. than tied to two. Right. Or he um, would have just concussed someone else. 
and then be out that's, for the rest of the playoffs. That's that's also possible, especially when you have Ryan Reeves out there. Like those two uh, probably would have been just going at each other for most of the series, but yeah, probably, probably. Um, but like, yeah, I just I do think I I still believe that Colorado ha- if they can get them like if they can get their their crap together here because they looked really like rattled in game four like they looked completely yeah, they looked str- like they, they had no idea what they were doing yeah. tonight already like just from what i'm seeing like obviously i'm not paying 100 percent attention right now but like just from like the little bits where i'm seeing it looks more even it looks like they're being able to not get just completely steamrolled like by the knights the way in especially like in the neutral zone and like trying the breakouts the way they had been the last game um which is good for them. Like, if they can get their stuff together, there's no reason why they still can't win and why they're not the better team, in my opinion. Right. Um, but the Knights prove that they can hang and that they can, like, take it to them in the same way. I think this is very much a series that it's good. It, the, the momentum ter- is going to turn on a dime, and whoever's just the last standing could be the one that will be the one that wins, kind of, right? Like, whoever just happens yeah. to have the momentum and hold it for as long as they can is probably going to win here. Yeah, like if um, if Vegas can build off of the two games that they won at home and win one on the road here against Colorado tonight, then it's like, oh shit, they might yeah. you know sense the kill and realize, okay, it's just it's just Philip Grubauer, guys. It isn't like Carey hey, Price. Is good, but yeah, okay, but you, you know what I mean though. Like it's not like okay, yeah, I get it. Like, isn't like not they're facing Andre Vasilevsky. Like, yeah, like they should be like, oh shit, we have Mark Andre Fleury you know, in practices and whatever, and we can beat him. And it's just Philip Grubauer. Like this guy was a backup as recently as two years ago to yeah, Braden yeah, Holby yeah. or three years ago or whatever it was. Like they're not facing some elite talent. I mean, he's good. Don't get me wrong, but it's not like they should be sweating their boots. Like apparently every Canadian team was when facing Carey Price or Connor Hellebuck. Like, mm-hmm. Hellebuck like didn't sh- have a good like series, you, and he still you, like made it difficult. Yeah, by having Flurry, you should win the goalie battle in ninety percent of the ninety percent of the time, right? Absolutely. And and in this particular case, like it's not like Flurry has been bad. They're not losing. They're not losing the goalie battle in the sense like Flurry's been terrible and getting outplayed by somebody worse. He's been very good. They just haven't been able. There were just points where very clearly uh, they were not able to put the puck in the net at the same at the rate at the same rate and they weren't able to match uh even against philip grubauer um again grubauer has been good i don't yeah. but uh and but you have to do more you have to do more to take it to him a little bit and um and obviously for vegas's case they have to win one game in colorado they can't they cannot win the series without it you have to be able yeah. to win a road game and uh if you can't win with and you, if you can only win games when you have last change you're going to be in a lot of trouble um, so I think Colorado is going to get it together. I think they'll be fine. I think, but I do hope this goes seven. I want to see this go seven. I want there to be a winner take all game seven. That's, that's my, that's my one goal hope for this series really at this point. Uh, selfishly, I, I kind of want every series to just get it over with and get like, I'm, I'm actually kind of itching for like the finals, to be honest. Like I really want the playoffs to be over just cause there's, this there's been... a, there's a lot of intrigue that's going to be coming it during this off season, like factoring the expansion draft, the actual draft itself, the fact that they're turning it around right away to try and get a se- season started in October. Like a lot of teams have a fuck load of people to resign and there is not enough cap to go around to resign them. So there's going to be just guys flying off the shelf basically. So like, selfishly, like I'm like, okay, get me the, get me the finals. I don't care if it's Colorado, Vegas, Habs versus Tampa, or I mean, I hope it's not the Isles. Oh, oh we got to talk about them. But they're, uh, okay, they're they're getting they they are a good team, and they're very good at shutting down a lead. It's just like they're so few and far between when it comes to scoring goals. Like if if Boston ties it up, then they'll then they'll score one. Like they're only. Net like scoring the cockroaches. Goals. They're cockroaches. Yeah, you can't. They'll kill score them. the goal because they need to, not because they want to run up the score to prevent being in a one goal situation. They are fine with the one goal situation. So the incentive for them to, you know, really go for it, like 
Matt Barzell like took until now to start scoring goals, like to really yeah. start producing. And he's like mm-hmm. electric to watch. And it's just like, they're just like, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, keep shutting it down, you know, get yeah. to the red line, dump the puck and, you know, we'll uh, tie it up for a bit. We got the one goal lead. So we're feeling safe. And it's like, it's like, Oh yeah. I don't yeah, care. It's it's abysmal hockey to watch. It's awful. Like it's just yeah. Like I mean we've done, we've been over it a thousand times at this yeah. point. Like the literally the like the fact that no team can figure them out like this at this point is embarrassing. T- <laughs> like I, Boston. Tampa, like Tampa will. like well, okay, Tampa will, but Tampa's in a different Tampa Tampa again, like I've mentioned but like I feel like like or at least I've talked about before, I think. Like they can like in Boston, I'd put in the same category. They're teams that kind of don't mind playing that style, the, the style the Islanders do. Mm-hmm. Like they don't mind. They don't. They. It's not their. It's not their main course. But they don't mind. But they're built in such a way that they don't mind playing it if they have to, and they don't mind matching that tempo. True. Um, so, which is why this the Bruins Islanders series has been especially boring because the Bruins are like, <laughs> yeah, sure, we'll play to your, we'll play to your strength. Yeah. yeah. Because we'll uh, we can match you on that, but of course, then the Bruins go out and completely lose, and then completely lose two very winnable games uh, against the, the Islanders. Against the, the most recent one was very interesting because Rask looked very shaky, and then a- there's all the comments afterwards where they're like, you know, he wasn't feeling well. That's why we pulled him before the third period, and it's kind mm-hmm. of like, okay, well, if you knew he wasn't feeling well, like after just well, two goals, why wouldn't you have pulled him sooner? I mean, they don't really have a better option is kind of the thing. I mean, they. I think they put in what uh, his name is. Jeremy uh, Swayman. D- Jeremy Swayman, yeah. yeah. And he, is, looks, he looked fine. He looked fine. He looked fine. He let in one goal. Oh, and then uh, meanwhile, I just saw, we talk about bad goals. Uh, Brandon, Brandon Saad, I believe, just scored a real muffin on Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, um, like, yeah, but like he's young and he shouldn't, you don't want to put him in that situation. Uh, he's not, yeah. he doesn't have the experience where you want to be putting him in at that that quick that easily uh that quickly in a in a playoff game especially one that like as momentum important as uh as valuable to momentum as game five it was mm-hmm. but again we talk already about how people in boston love to dump on to Rask. like really it's you're just you're throwing him to the wolves in that case to a certain extent the yeah. one other thing that's worth noting uh is after the game bruce cassidy uh was ta- asked about the the penal- the penalties and stuff uh, was about about the play and Cass and this is this is from ESPN. Uh, this is a this is the quote he had. Uh, this is my take on it. We're playing a team that has ver- has a very well respected management and coaching staff, but I think they sell a narrative over there that's it's more like the New York Saints, not the New York Islanders. They play hard and they play the right way, but I feel we're the same way. And the exact calls that get called on us do not get called on them, and I don't know why. And for that those comments, Bruce Cassidy was fined twenty five thousand dollars. Now. Here's the thing. Everybody was laughing at Bruce Cassidy being like, bro, you coach the Bruins. You have no room to talk about non-calls. And yeah. <laughs> true. And that is super true. But at the same time, he's kind of right. Like, like he's it's very it's another one of those the worst person you know just made a great point kind of thing. Be- yeah. And the case in point for me is uh there was the David Krejci situation where he got fined for uh, spearing Matthew in the Barzells, as I think some people put it. Uh, yeah, after, I like that. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, that's a good one. So you got fined for that. Um, <laughs> but the whole point, the whole thing about that is that if you watch the replay of when he did that, he had been cross, Barzell had cross-checked him like viciously in the back multiple times and he didn't have the puck when he didn't have the puck. And then Krejci snaps and spears him. Yeah, what Krejci did was still... He leaves the to do it. It's really you funny. You can't... Well, Krejci is still in the wrong for what he did. Yeah. He also maybe... And I think Rachel Dory was the one who brought this up. He maybe doesn't do that if you call one of the three very blatant cross-checks on him. Yeah. And this is... this, And he they are right in the sense that the Islanders get away with a lot. Like, I saw multiple cases where... Like, and during this season where, like, Leo Komarov, like, nearly decapitates somebody and there's no call or no there was, nothing. Like There was, like, an instance in the game where I think Marshawn was, like, going, th- like, driving through center. He took a chop to the hands and then uh, got hooked to the ice. And they didn't call anything. Yeah, and there was, like, five go. minutes left. It's like, like, I'm what not a Bruins fan, but, I mean, if you're going to call, you know, four you're gonna call plays that on- for Islanders, you 
you gotta call that too. Yeah, and the, and this goes back to again the whole situation with why the way the game management situation is set up doesn't work, and the way that it benefits dirtier teams to play at a level that they're the to play at a level that they want. And uh, I brought this up in regards to the Lightning today because Kucherov got away with a really dirty like slew foot, I think, on like Niederreiter. I mean, on Niederreiter. The thing is, and the way the way this system is set up and why it's unfair is like the even up calls benefit teams like the Islanders and the Lightning, who are have no problem taking making dirtier plays uh, yeah. over the course of the game because they know, especially when you get to the playoffs, they're going to get called. A, they're going to get called less overall, but. As soon as they go to the box a few times, they're not gonna. They know you're not gonna. The refs aren't gonna call them again for a while because mm. they need to keep the calls fair for the other team, even if that yeah, team yeah. is way cleaner. Uh, in game this game case, the, yeah, and in this case, the Islanders and the Bruins are more or less the same. But it is kind of hilarious how the Islanders are considered this clean team, even though very clearly they're not. And they're just getting the benefit of a lot more calls. And maybe that, and that could be just entirely due to say, maybe they don't argue with the refs as much. Maybe they're, maybe they're more buddy, buddy with them. And maybe. that's because that's totally a thing that happens in the NHL is players who are nicer to the refs sometimes get more benefits of the calls just by being nicer to them. Like, or and not being like, are you like, are you effing kidding me sort of thing? Like after calls, right? Like, that's a, that can do it. And there's and the NHL doesn't see anything wrong with that being like a like a, something that's p- able to happen. Yeah. Like you should be calling it objectively. The rail book shouldn't change based on what time of the game it is, who's playing, mm-hmm. uh, how many penalties one team has over the other. He like Cassidy is right in the certain extent that yeah, the Bruins are clearly getting calls like getting called on things that the Islanders aren't, even though they're both making them. Like they're both yeah. taking them. Like what he's saying isn't that the Bruins should stop getting called on those things. He's saying yeah. that if you're gonna call it on Boston, which you should, yeah, you should also be calling it on the Islanders yeah. when they do the same thing, which no, they his point aren't makes, right now. His point makes sense. It's just like yeah. it's very it's funny. Just a, for, it's just pop calling the kettle black. Hear, it's 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 so wonderful to hear a Boston Bruins team complaining about, about unfair about, refereeing. Like, about lousy refereeing. Yeah, what a... He, oh, oh my, how the tough. turntables, right? Like, should, yeah. I mean, they just need to hire Colin Campbell to their executive staff and then get his dad to fucking run some favors for him again. Yep. Um, I did find it was interesting that um, apparently... I can't remember which coach was fined. La- or Rod B- Brindamore was fined twenty five thousand dollars last year for complaining about refereeing, and it was the exact same exact ref. same ref. It's like, yep, eh, a little hmm. dicey. And hmm. figures figures the NHL hasn't done anything about it. But I mean, Cesc Levy, I'm let's sure, move I'm sure, on. Yeah, I, I, yeah. In car- in regards to the refing thing, I think there was some like info that came out recently about that whole situation. But like, I'm sure Roxy Fever will do a great in-depth they, episode on it they just dropped their episode where they go over the 2011 conspiracy theory after right. jackson spent the last few That's... days going over all the release concussion lawsuit emails i am right. i'm itching to wrap up this episode and then go listen and and hear what he's discovered because yeah the preview honestly... video they put out there was already so funny when the emails revealed that they had but insulted to- todd faderuck <laughs> Yeah. They said, gee, this guy sounds like he takes a lot of punches to the heads. And these are like executives in the NHL saying this. Just like, oh my God. Yep. Just I, I almost doofuses. Yeah, I almost I, I honestly like I'm sure it's gonna be great. I'm that might be one of the few episodes of their show that I don't listen to because I, I don't need that. I don't I don't need to you hear need how triggered. much more the I don't need to be yeah, I don't need to be uh triggered by how job the Canucks got. I I I, I can't come to terms with it as it is. Yeah. I don't need more. Um, well, okay. Instead of, okay, so like, have some, of, have some jets? Say, here, you're ruining my transition. Sorry. My apologies. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Go, go ahead. I was going to say, instead of talking about the Canucks getting jobbed by uh, circumstances out of their control, why don't we talk about the Canucks getting jobbed out of their own stupidity? And that's Tyler Toffoli. Scoring the series winner against the Winnipeg Jets in overtime off of a great strip by Cole Caulfield and a beautiful pass between two Jets defensemen for the easiest tap-in goal of Toffoli's career. 
they the Habs, who everyone was saying this is going to be the easiest series win for Toronto, they look completely listless. They have nothing going on for them. They're down three to one. They complete the comeback, three games, then they sweep the Jets in four, seven game win streak. Their their longest streak of the entire season. Yep. Unbelievable comeback. Juggernaut. They're a juggernaut. Team. Yeah. I mean, it's what, what it's you- good because like like I have no like ill will towards the Habs. Like I I enjoyed them when PK Subban was on the team. I like that Brendan yes. Gallagher is on the team. I like Col- Cole Caulfield. I like Joel Armia from my Winnipeg Jets days. I I'm a big fan of Carey Price. Like yeah. I have no reason to dislike the Habs. Like really, yeah. uh, Mark Bergevin's like kind of funny to me just because like he's like used to be he's like a. a an enforcer goon type and like he's just like this former canuck mark version former canuck, a lot mark of people Bergevin. forget that like they keep showing him like after they win and he's like down like by the boards and he's like bro hugging everybody like that's that's nice well also like pumping iron because he's got yeah, those like course. python arms he, he, yeah he, he's hugging them while holding kettle kettlebells in his arms Hurrah, good yeah. job arm yeah, day so yeah i i'm totally all for the habs going to the uh, next round, I love the fact that they were the latest teams to start a series, and now they're the first to enter the final round. Like that's they deserve so a rest. They really oh, deserve yeah. a rest. Thank God. Like they I really are, they're gonna need it. I'm trying to think. I don't think they have anyone that's like injured. Oh, Jeff Petrie. Jeff Petrie Jeff Petri. apparently Ooh, that, had and that would be fingers. That's a big get for them when they return. I think because he's like whoever. playing through it. I because th- he's playing through it. I think he's supposed to have surgery yeah. at the end of the playoffs, which is. Nuts. I don't like that, especially after, nope. especially after the Kevin Bieksa story that he had on Sportsnet, where he was like, you know, I had the option to do surgery on his hand after, like, you know, he broke some something, and the doctor said, if you don't get surgery, like, you're gonna lose feeling because of the nerve or whatever. And he's like, well, I gotta play because it's playoffs, and so he did it, and now he says like he can't feel anything in a couple fingers of his hand, and like doesn't have like the range of motion that he would hope for. And it ruined. It didn't ruin, but it made his next season in Anaheim incredibly difficult. And so I hear Jeff Petrie, who's been like an unbelievable defender for years for them. Yeah, this year he got more. He got he got the time he was due. He got the time, yeah. the 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 attention he deserved because yeah. they had more time to give to like Jeff Petrie on like national broadcasts and how well he was doing. But you would hate to see Jeff Petrie rush an injury to come back. And like the Habs are going to be in it tough, regardless if that's Vegas, regardless if that's Colorado, but you would hate to see him do like longstanding damage to his fingers or his hand. And he has a regression next season because he tried to play through it for a, a a near impossible series to win for that team. I'm not saying they can't do it, but it's obviously going to be, it's an uphill climb and you don't want to see a guy jeopardizing his future career to you know, sprint uphill. Yeah. It's, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I obviously, I don't know a whole lot about injuries and everything. Like, I mean, we're no doctors. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say like, you know, just because it's, you know, it's the, it's, uh, it's one particular finger. I'm a little less like, oh, well, it's like, you know, it's his choice at the end of the day, or at least we yeah, hope exactly. it's his choice. Like, hopefully, that was his... It, at the very least, you know, it's your body, it's your decision, what you want to do with it. Like, um, yeah. you... There's nothing we can... We or, like, say the team could do... Pretend, well, the team Well, could. the team could do something. The as team you know, could and say, no, no, no. They could say, no, 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 you're going to go get surgery. Yeah. Or, like, they're gonna... They could They could say... They could override him, but that, oh, but that also ask the question like okay whose decision is it in those cases to make that call on the injury front right like is it the player whose body is the one being put on the line or is it the team that has that's paying them the money right and depending on what we're talking about that honestly that answer could vary but um you know like you're going you're you're at the point where it's like you know it's the final four the Habs might not get back here for a while and hell it might be the final shot he has it might be the final shot he has hell like this is Shea Weber's first time in the conference finals in his career. And that's wild. Like, which is that absolutely is wild. Be- insane. 
Like, you think about all the good teams that Shea Weber has been on, like, yeah. either in Montreal or in Nashville, yeah. and you're like, it's, like, wild that this is the first time, and he's nearly, he's nearing the end of his career already, he's in his mid-30s, like, stunning. He's, like, almost 40. He literally, he like yeah, something like that, he's still got a long yeah. way on his contract to go, Um because it, it, he, I think he, I believe he literally just missed out on the big Predators renaissance. Like he was there for the start of it, but then like right as they turned it around and started turning into like a regular finalist, yeah. they had already well because PK Subban was there when they got to the finals. They had already traded him, like which is just nuts. Um, yeah, so the yeah this might be your only shot if you want that if you want the cup. I think they should have maybe taken more of an approach similar to what say. I think teams should take more closely an approach to, like, say, what the Lightning did last year with Stamkos, where they're like, okay, okay, we're not going to use you unless the last shot in the last shot in the barrel, here we go, sort of thing, right? Where it's very much we're going to hold you, oh, we're going to keep you out of the lineup entirely uh, and let you rehab that injury unless it's like an elimination is at is on the line, sort of thing. Which I think, yeah, because. Like, in theory, you should just be, yeah, keep them as healthy as you possibly can. If you really yeah. want to play them, wait until you last your last shot. If you, yeah, if you the... have no option, it's like you need, you're in uh, elimination game territory, then sure, yeah, throw okay. them out there for One a game. game but like, go for it. Maybe but it if works. you can win with just, you know, Alexander Without Romanov him. and Eric Gustafsson or whatever as your defenseman. Romanov, who should have been theoretically playing the whole time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And okay, and I did like the Habs have won in ways that have been surprising, especially just based on like the contributions they're getting. Like Corey Perry, talk about a bet that turned out well for them. Like minimum league minimum turned out to do just in like did perfectly in the role that he was given. Like yeah. has done a great job. And I, you know, I, you know, we don't really like Corey Perry. The player isn't exactly like someone you want to root for, but like, hey, look at him go. Look, look at this old guy go. He, as he like he knows how to win man in. like i feel yeah. like people forgot or forget like he was literally just in the stanley cup playoffs with dallas yep he, he was just there the guy knows how to get he won it a cup done. with the he won the cup with the ducks i think he was a did he win the heart one year or was he, a, he at least a finalist he won the year where everyone said uh i believe henrik should have won. Was it when Henrik Daniel, won the... Daniel, 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 or Daniel. Cause I... Yeah, because Henrik right. had won the year before. Henrik had won the year before. Right, they and they gave, were... it to, they gave it to Corey Perry because he hit 50 goals, which... Sure. Sure, why not? But sure. that was clearly like... You know, remember when that was remember that when 50 goals was impressive now it's not because mcdavid can do that and matthews can kind of do that on a whim when they want to could they win um, in the playoffs though don't think so bud yep oh yes that yes because the yeah. yes that totally matters uh yeah i want as a as a someone who's followed the jets for as long as you have i mean connor hellebuck mm -hmm. did very well uh in this series i think he looked he did as better bad. He looked better, like, but he he did as much as it was possible for him to do. Like, yeah. there he you he can't put the puck in the net, so you're not gonna win unless he's uh, without someone scoring. And they weren't getting the score. He was not getting the run support he needed. Shifley and Demello, those two losses, one to suspension, one to injury. In your opinion, that killed them, right? Like that well, just tanked. Demel it. DeMello wasn't, like, such a big loss that you would ever be like, oh, they lost the series because Dylan DeMello's gone. Like, De DeMello's a really good, sh like, shutdown defenseman who, like, usually puts up really good, like, underlying metrics. Mm -hmm. But, obviously, like, Shifley was one of the few guys producing. He had an awful game one. So we'll never know. And then he gets suspended, of course. But we'll never know if, like, he would have bounced back and been, like, you know, a key contributor that, like, at least gave them a ch fighting chance. But, like the underlying metrics for every single game were just dreadful. Like they got completely destroyed, generated absolutely nothing. Like, it, like put this in perspective, like for rookie defenseman or rookie defenseman's goal scoring, Logan Stanley is tied with the most goals at two. And he scored both of them in, in that game. game. Four. That yeah. was the only run support they had. And it was from a guy who is like, basically their next Tyler Myers, but like a bit more defensively oriented and he's not that terribly good. And that's the only goals that they had got. Like they got absolutely nothing out of anyone. So I like, I genuinely don't know what was going on in the locker room. I, I always think back to 
when I think it was in the weeks before or after the Patrick Line trade for Dubois, who was invisible for the entire series, might I yeah. add. Wow. Um, they kind of revealed that Blake Wheeler was like a huge fucking asshole to everyone on the team. In, allegedly, allegedly. Protect, uh, gotta well, protect, the, gotta protect he, us. Yes. Allegedly, but he alleges it himself that he handled right. the team's playoff runs both in their first big run that ended against Vegas and their second one that ended, you know, in the first round. He against said, Saint like, Lewis you know, State. he treated like his teammates really poorly. He wasn't the same person he was at home. Like he was really just like could only think about playoffs and everyone else's playing ability. And it made him not the type healthy, of player yeah. he wanted to be. And so I think about like that and I'm like, okay, if you're Blake Wheeler, you're like late thirties. Like he looked really slow and like genuinely like a liability, like in that Hab series, like he looked so slow on the power the play evens he Once um start, yeah i was just to say like he he might be like feeling the frustration or the pressure of like okay this is like one of my last shots because after this season we're losing a good player to the expansion draft and the jets are kind of in this listless territory where it's like they need to completely revamp their defensive core but the problem is no one ever wants to sign in winnipeg so if you're blake wheeler who signed to this like eight million dollar contract you're not going anywhere. You're you're stuck there and you have to do everything you can to win. And I'm sure after the game one, losing Shifley, he was probably pissed. And I'm sure he was like, well, fuck, there goes our season. And it that's the truth. And so I I wonder how that locker room's gonna react to like not even just a series loss, but like an embarrassing loss. Like they weren't in it at all. They got it's- crushed. It's 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 so well it's so tough from their perspective right because yeah as much as they got crushed by the Canadians they also did the same to the Oilers so it's mm-hmm. it's going to be especially hard for them to be like okay so did we just did we just completely suck or did we get or are we better than we played like yeah. it, it's you're almost in a spot where you can't really te- where if you're the management team it's at least from their perspective it's probably hard to tell what direction you should be going because right. on one hand you took out a team with two of the best players in the world on it but then the second a team with a little bit more depth came along you got just steamrolled um and like again i talk about all the time like there there is almost sometimes a rock paper scissors uh aspect to hockey teams like there are some teams that are just built to beat other teams uh right even to beat other teams even if on paper they're not as good like the canadians i would say i would argue at least right now don't have as much star power as the jets do at least up front Mm -hmm. but they are very clearly a more complete team and has have a style of play that really gives the Jets problems and gave them problems throughout that whole series. Um, at the end of the day, like the question really comes down to like, but like as much as the Jets lost, they still get to hang their head on the fact that they beat one of the that they beat a great team. So I yeah, guess the real that. question is here is who is who who is the wor- who looks the worst coming out of this series? Is it the is it the Oilers? Is it the Leafs? Or is it Jim Benning for giving up a guy who is so good? And by the way, Tyler Toffoli, I just want to say, I love the guy. I absolutely love the guy. Like, there's the photo of him, like, walking his dog after winning. Yeah. Um, there's, like, the whole joke that he puts his hands on his, like, on, he does, like, the hands on hips thing, like, when he, like, stands, which is very, which I find especially funny because I also do that all the time. The dad, the dad pose? Yeah, I always get I, I I I very much relate to Tyler Toffoli on a personality standpoint, and yeah. like especially his whole comment with Caulfield, where he's like, "He's so small, I couldn't find him." In the yeah, crowd. He's a little I, that was that that's was cute. that's a very yeah. He has this energy about him that I really relate to, yeah. and I'm like, I love this guy. Like, I want I would I would want his jersey or something if I could. Um, but to answer your question, yeah. the team that looks the worst out of all this is the Jets. Like, I know we like the rag on Jim Benning wow. when he gave up to Foley, but the yeah. Jets 
did play a very structured game and their depth carried them against the Edmonton Oilers that featured two of the most difficult players to contain in hockey. Then they go on and get nothing from anybody. That's that's a tough pill to swallow. And when you're a team like the Jets, where you have ton of your cap already allocated, you've got most of your core like locked up. They don't really know what they've got in Christian Veselainen yet. He played some minutes, but was mostly invisible. But the issue for them is they just made a huge, huge move to get rid of both Roslovic and Line in exchange for Pierre Luc Dubois. And he looks awful to the point of where I'm like, I don't know if you could even trade him and recoup the value you lost in that trade. Oh, and now it's kind, of, it's kind of a wash because it's like, okay, well, Line A looked like shit and Roslovic looked marginally okay. But obviously when you're trading away like a generational goal scorer and like a depth piece that you probably would have wanted if he wanted to stay – for a guy that you know former top three pick guy that should arguably be one of your top two centers next year and you're coming away from the series going i can't even put him on the fourth line with nate thompson and matthew parole because i can't trust him to do anything that's Mm -hmm. for so for for me as a jets fan i'm like oh god they lost they learned nothing they gained nothing they basically are stuck in this purgatory kind of like the Canucks after the, the Calgary flame series where, or sorry, after the, after the sharks sweep and they were like, okay, do we rebuild or do we try and, you know, keep try spinning the, the wheel? New coach. Yeah. So that's where they're at, where they are in purgatory. And they're, they're they, was need, very... they need a lot to basically re they're basically the Canucks kind of, they need a lot to get, back to a position where they can actually do more than just upset one team and then get steamrolled by the next. Like they need a lot. You almost hope you almost in a way you almost hope that their energy was, well, we beat the Oilers. We've we've done we've done yeah. mission accomplished. We did everyone here. a favor and we're you al- Yeah, you almost you almost hope that they just were like, well, we've we've already done enough. We're good here. We don't need to put it yeah. we're not gonna give it we're not gonna give it the full 100 but like i mean to a certain extent you like yeah you almost hope that yeah but yeah the jets are very much in a gonna be in a bit of limbo here we're especially going into next year where they're gonna be back in the central division which is gonna be i don't i don't want to say like too much stronger i think the central division is in itself rel- outside of like you know colorado and vegas is and it's tough to very say much in its own no transition idea. We have no idea what's going to happen in the expansion draft process. Like there could be a dramatic shift. Like, I mean, if Eichel gets traded, he could end up like, you know, out West, he could end up on the predators. Like you have no idea what could happen to the landscape as we see it. But anyway, very true. um, Um, Why don't we get into some like questions from Twitter before we we, uh, wrap up? Cause we have a good one. Did you? Yeah, we have one. We have one question. We have one last question. Cause we got two today. We got one last question here. Uh, this is from uh, at CSWC Andy. Yeah. Uh, face wins cups. Um, why, why? This is this is actually a really good question. Why do people support the Canucks still? <laughs> Will hockey become boring if the Canucks ever win? Essentially, is the chase better than the prize? I. What do you want to uh, go first here, or should I? Should I? Okay. Well, people support the Canucks because they have hope. And they enjoy the sport and they have a sense of pride in their local team and the personalities and bodies that have spent time in the organization. And overall, most good people in the world want to see people do well and succeed. It just happens that for the sporting team, it's because they play for their local club. So Troy Stetcher, the Troy Stetchers of the world, the Ben Huttons of the world, the Frankie Corrado's, I know they're all defense defensemen, but I'm not making a defenseman point. But you have all these guys who, like, you know, they were here and they were Canucks players, and you rooted for them because Ben Hutton did his stupid dance at the Dyson Ice, Stetcher because he was the local kid, Frankie Corrado because he was the only defensive prospect that the Canucks ever had for like a few years, and so you root for them to go on elsewhere if the team lets them go or they get traded or whatever. You root for them to have success because at least they carry with them little bit of that Vancouver legacy. And so there's still enjoyment that 
these guys, even though they aren't part of your team, they still like have the Vancouver heart in them, or you hope that they left with a little bit of Vancouver in them and they carried it to their new place. Tyler yeah. Toffoli had his little uh, Players Tribune thing, and he was like, I was meant to be a Hab, but he still loves all the former Canucks he played with. They're always and wanted to and had run. wanted to be a Canuck and had wanted, wanted to be a Canuck. He definitely wanted one of the one. rare times that the Canucks could have had a player of his caliber yeah. who actually wanted to sign there and would have chosen yeah. Vancouver over anywhere else, which is incredible. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and, and even they let him was, go. Oh, they let him go. And For they, nothing. They, re- they re-signed a bunch of bums instead, but to fully like, he barely played for the Canucks. He, like, he was, barely a player for the Canucks. The Canucks gave up a ton for him and everyone like said how risky it was and it didn't and yet I will really go. work out, but I'll always think of Toffoli as a Vancouver Canuck because of what he's doing right now. I'm like they could have had him. Yeah. Like there's I such a legacy of- to the guys that leave or come and stay and then come and go. It doesn't yeah. matter. And I'm sure every other team feels the same way. If, T- if Toffoli scores another 20 goals next year, it's going to be fucking amazing because every yeah. single time Fire Benning's going to be trending, and even if Benning's gone in two years, every It'll time probably still scores, be trending, even if he's like totally still gone. going to be thank you, Jim, and that to <laughs> me is so amazing, and that's why like hockey can never be boring as a Canucks fan because even if they're dog shit and they have been for so many years through their own internal fumblings, and it's still completely entertaining if it's just the chase and it's not the win, it's still entertaining. Mm-hmm. It won't ever be boring because it's it's such a drama. What was that that NHL thing they put no out? With soap like, operas, no, just no soap opera. Just hockey. I love that. Honestly, that is why isn't all... that a T-shirt yet? Like, if the NHL was smart yeah, and good at marketing themselves, that would be a T-shirt. Nah, that would be that, that would be a great them. T-shirt. Um, okay. Um, yeah, that's 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 the gist of it. It's just like everything surrounding the Canucks is a soap opera. Canucks Twitter will remind you of that. Players that have no business being loved and revered here get loved and revered. Victor Oreskovic or whatever, Lee Sweat, just guys that are just literally guys that get called up by a a radio station nine years after they scored one goal to talk to them about their time as the Canucks. And I'm sure they're just like, um, why are you calling me? Like, I have, I have to go balance my TPS reports. Like, come on. Cool oral history, great oral history articles are based sometimes off of not, not a Canuck, but somebody again, somebody who played against the Canucks and made a pivotal yeah. error, like Chris Campoli in yeah. the, the Chicago series. And what a hero for even answering. What a hero for answering. Fan. Yeah. For talking about exactly it. Like he did a great, he was awesome. He was the star of that article was Camp, yeah. Campoli. Um, and yeah, and I was thinking about this question. Like, first of all, this question I think, honest, arguably, could belong. Honestly, might be even more at home in, like, say, like an ethics like lecture or like a philosophy class, right? Rather than a hockey show, because there is kind of an there is a, there. I think it depends entirely, honestly, on who you ask. Like, for some people, like you know, for some people, I would say I'm sure there is. Yes, there are some fans out there where it's like you know they where winning the cup would almost be the equivalent to say knowing everything there is to know about the universe kind of thing. And that question of like, you know, is there, it has, does life become meaningless if you knew everything, if you knew everything possible about the entire universe, would life become meaningless and boring, right? There is, there is kind of an element to that for some people. I will say if there has one good thing for me personally if there is one good thing that has come out of the Canucks just being as bad as they have been for like the last half decade, I would say, or I guess closer to almost a full decade now at this point, but like, yeah. I would say that if there's one good thing that's come out of it for me personally, it's that I have stopped caring as much. I've stopped dying, living and dying on the results and just liking the sport for what it is and for the actual the entertainment journey. For the story, the journeys, like the storylines day to day, it's a reality show. It's sports. Yeah. It's entertainment. It's 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 a great thing. Like it's it's fun. I enjoy it. like one of the things that I've come to really appreciate is just watching hockey games that don't always involve the Canucks. Now, like yeah. ma- before, I might have just been hyper focused on what the Canucks are doing and no one else. And there's and there's a lot of fans who are like that. And that's you know what. And if that's the way they want to be, like that's totally okay. Like that is totally. Within your realm. 
this is like in itself there are different sects of the fan base who have different reasons for why they like the Canucks and why they support the team and why they watch hockey. It changes, right? For and for me, yeah, like I've come to appreciate the games that I watch for uh and the other teams that I see play on a nightly basis sometimes. Uh, more in the last couple of years and I come to appreciate hockey as just the sports as the sport that I enjoy and like the different little intricacies intricate details of it like one of like I'll say this all the time like one of my favorite ho- one of the best hockey games I have ever been to in my entire life uh was a Sharks Bruins game that I went to a couple years ago where like I was kind of you know as the Canucks fan there I was more a bystander to that game like I was watching as a third party and yet, like, the crowd was incredible. The sport, the hockey itself was really good. Uh, you got some, like, really cool key moments, like Joe Thornton scoring his first hat trick in a decade. Like, uh, some controversial goals and the fans, like, throwing things on the ice when the calls went against them. Like, I'd never seen that in person. I'd never seen a crowd, especially for a regular season game, get as animated and as visibly pissed off as the, the SAP center did when the shark, when the Bruins won in overtime off a controversial goal. I like as somebody who's, you know, I have no rooting interest in that game really, but it was incredible. Like it was some of the best hockey I had ever seen just from the way that the teams played and the atmosphere around it was incredible. And sometimes that gets lost. And sometimes that might get lost when you're cheer, when you're focusing so much on one team and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I do, I will say, like, I don't, if the Canucks won the cup, I would, it would not change how I feel about hockey. It would not change about the fact that, you know what, next year it starts over again. Let's go again for it. Go, you do it all, you run it back, go for another, go for number two. There, yeah. it will, for me, for some people, that's the end of the journey and they're fine with that and that's okay. For me, uh, there will never not be a case where I'm just like, I, I want to see them just keep doing it. I want to see that, have that feeling over and over again. For sure. Uh, thanks so much, Andy, for the question. Uh, it's always great. good to like good flex the brain muscle a bit. Uh, yeah. We don't get to do that often in our daily lives. No, so we're pretty We stupid. appreciate it, Mr. Andrew. That <laughs> means a lot. But if you would like to get your questions into the program, don't forget to message us on Twitter. You can find me at Cody Sievertson. Lachlan, where can they tw- tweet at you? You can tweet at me as well as find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Lock in the Crease. And, uh, you can, and you can find my work at LockInTheCrease.com where I do articles sometimes. It is also the new <laughs> home of uh, CreaseCast.ca, which is uh, where you can go to find more of our episodes, a back, a back catalog of all of our old episodes and uh, info about us and what we do. Um, you can also, you should also, uh, make sure to, uh, jo- check out our Patreon if you really enjoyed the show. For five bucks a month, you get bonus episodes and other exclusive content over at patreon.com slash creasecast. It's, a uh, it's a good bargain in my opinion. We do more stuff that's a little bit more just, uh, fun and just for summer entertainment. And- yeah, uh, and if you... If you do like your, our content, make sure to rate, like, and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, on every podcast platform service that you use for us. Tell us, tell your parents, tell your friends, tell your mom, tell tell your dad, tell your grandma. We're we're really hot with grandmas lately. Um, <laughs> oh my god! So much. Almost almost had a perfect show there. Good lord! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, you're really yeah. whiffed on that last one. Good lord! What a that's like losing a perfect game like yeah, the, in the ninth inning. Good lord! Recommend our program to all the gilfs you know in the world. And we, until oh. until oh. our next oh. episode, folks, we will catch you guys later. Bye. Bye.